This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 8 now, my dear Elizabeth, said I, waking early next morning, let us talk a little on this grand project of changing our residence, to which there are many objections. First, it seems wise to remain on the spot where Providence has cast us, where we can have at once means of support drawn from the ship, and security from all attacks protected by the rock, the river, and the sea on all sides. My wife distrusted the river, which could not protect us from the jackals and complained of the intolerable heat of this sandy desert, of her distaste for such food as oysters and wild geese, and lastly, of her agony of mind when we ventured to the wreck, willingly renouncing all its treasures and begging that we might rest content with the blessings we already had. "'There is some truth in your objections,' said I, "'and perhaps we may erect a dwelling under the roots of your favourite tree.' But among these rocks we must have a storehouse for our goods, and a retreat in case of invasion. I hope, by blowing off some pieces of the rock with powder, to be able to fortify the part next the river, leaving a secret passage known only to ourselves. This would make it impregnable. But before we proceed we must have a bridge to convey our baggage across the river." "'A bridge,' said she, in a tone of vexation. Then when shall we get from here? Why cannot we ford it as usual? The cow and ass could carry our stores. I explained to her how necessary it was for our ammunition and provision to be conveyed over without risk of wetting, and begged her to manufacture some bags and baskets, and leave the bridge to me and my boys. If we succeeded, it would always be useful. As for fear of danger from lightning or accident, I intended to make a powder magazine among the rocks. The important question was now decided. I called up my sons and communicated our plans to them. They were greatly delighted, though somewhat alarmed, at the formidable project of the bridge. Besides, the delay was vexatious. They were all anxious for removal into the land of promise, as they chose to call it. We read prayers, and then thought of breakfast. The monkey sucked one of the goats as if it had been its mother. My wife milked the cow and gave us boiled milk with biscuit for our breakfast, part of which she put in a flask for us to take on our expedition. We then prepared our boat for a voyage to the vessel to procure planks and timber for our bridge. I took both Ernest and Fritz, as I foresaw our cargo would be weighty and require all our hands to bring it to shore. We rowed vigorously till we got into the current, which soon carried us beyond the bay. We had scarcely reached a little isle at the entrance when we saw a vast number of gulls and other sea-birds fluttering with discordant cries over it. I hoisted the sail, and we approached rapidly. And when near enough, we stepped on shore and saw that the birds were feasting so eagerly on the remains of a huge fish that they did not even notice our approach. We might have killed numbers even with our sticks. This fish was the shark which Fritz had so skilfully shot through the head the night before. He found the marks of his three balls. Ernest drew his ramrod from his gun, and struck so vigorously right and left among the birds that he killed some, and put the rest to flight. We then hastily cut off some pieces of the skin of the monster which I thought might be useful, and placed them in our boat. But this was not the only advantage we gained by landing. I perceived an immense quantity of wrecked timber lying on the shore of the island, which would spare us our voyage to the ship. We selected such planks as were fit for our purpose. Then, by the aid of our jack-screw, and some levers we had brought with us, we extricated the planks from the sand and floated them. And, binding the spars and yards together with cords, with the planks above them, like a raft, we tied them to the stern of our boat and hoisted our sail. Fritz, as we sailed, was drying the shark's skin, which I hoped to convert into files. 
and Ernest, in his usual reflective manner, observed to me, "'What a beautiful arrangement of providence it is, that the mouth of the shark should be placed in such a position that he is compelled to turn on his back to seize his prey, thus giving it a chance of escape, else with his excessive veracity he might depopulate the ocean.' At last we reached our landing-place, and, securing our boat, and calling out loudly, we soon saw our friends running from the river, each carried a handkerchief filled with some new acquisition, and Francis had over his shoulder a small fishing-net. Jack reached us first, and threw down before us from his handkerchief some fine crawfish. They had each as many, forming a provision for many days. Francis claimed the merit of the discovery. Jack related that Francis and he took a walk to find a good place for the bridge. "'Thank you, Mr. Architect,' said I. "'Then you must superintend the workmen. Have you fixed on your place?' "'Yes, yes,' cried he. "'Only listen. When we got to the river, Francis, who was looking about, called out, "'Jack! Jack! Fritz's jackal is covered with crabs. Come, come!' I ran to tell Mama, who brought a net that came from the ship and we caught these in a few minutes, and could have got many more if you had not come. I commanded them to put the smaller ones back into the river, reserving only as many as we could eat. I was truly thankful to discover another means of support. We now landed our timber. I had looked at Jack's site for the bridge, and thought my little architect very happy in his selection, but it was at a great distance from the timber. I recollected the simplicity of the harness the Laplanders used for their reindeer. I tied cords to the horns of the cow, as the strength of this animal is in the head, and then fastened the other ends round the piece of timber we wanted moving. I placed a halter round the neck of the ass, and attached the cords to this. We were thus enabled, by degrees, to remove all our wood to the chosen spot, where the sides of the river were steep, and appeared of equal height. It was necessary to know the breadth of the river, to select the proper planks, and Ernest proposed to procure a ball of pack-thread from his mother, to tie a stone to one end of the string, and throw it across the river, and to measure it after drawing it back. This expedient succeeded admirably. We found the breadth to be eighteen feet, but as I proposed to give the bridge strength by having three feet at least resting on each shore, we chose some planks of twenty-four feet in length. How we were to get these across the river was another question, which we prepared to discuss during dinner, to which my wife now summoned us. Our dinner consisted of a dish of crawfish and some very good rice-milk, but before we began we admired her work. She had made a pair of bags for the ass, sewed with pack-thread, but having no large needles she had been obliged to pierce holes with a nail a tedious and painful process. Well satisfied with her success, we turned to our repast, talking of our bridge, which the boys, by anticipation, named the non-pariah. We then went to work. There happened to be an old trunk of a tree standing on the shore. To this I tied my main beam by a strong cord, loose enough to turn round the trunk. Another cord was attached to the opposite end of the beam, long enough to cross the river twice. I took the end of my rope over the stream, where we had previously fixed the block, used in our boat, to a tree, by the hook which usually suspended it. I passed my rope, and returned with the end to our own side. I then harnessed my cow and ass to the end of my rope, and drove them forcibly from the shore. The beam turned slowly round the trunk, then advanced, and was finally lodged over the river amidst the shouts of the boys, its own weight keeping it firm. Fritz and Jack leaped on it immediately to run across, to my great fear. We succeeded in placing four strong beams in the same way, and by the aid of my sons I arranged them at a convenient distance from each other, that we might have a broad and good bridge. We then laid down planks close together across the beams, but not fixed, as in time of danger it might be necessary rapidly to remove the bridge. My wife and I were as much excited as the children, and ran across with delight. Our bridge was at least ten feet broad. Thoroughly fatigued with our day of labor, we returned home, supped, and offered thanks to God, 
and went to rest. End of chapter.